Hey everyone, I'm Vinayak and this is a Hitchhiker's Guide to CLIs in Python. In the beginning was the command line. Well, not quite the command line we know today. They were typewriters and we were communicating using Morse code. So one fine day someone had an idea to connect a typewriter to an existing set of communication wires. And the teletypewriter was born. Teletypes removed the need for an operator to know Morse code and improved message typing speed and delivery time making it possible for messages to be flashed across the country with little manual intervention. In this 1932 video, the narrator describes how a teletype takes only a matter of seconds to deliver a message from London to Edinburgh, which is in stark contrast to the earlier ETA of one week. One week was the time taken by a mail coach to undertake the 400 mile journey. Meanwhile, computers were becoming powerful enough to multitask and interact with users in real time, in contrast to the earlier batch processing model. So another fine day, someone had another idea to connect a teletype to a modem which would let them interact with these computers remotely. Among these teletypes was the Fryden Flexo writer and the teletype model 33. Teletypes like these were adapted to provide a user interface to early computers and this was the origin of the command line interface. Users typed commands after a prompt character was printed on paper. After they were satisfied with the input, they would press enter, which would send the command to the computer. And finally, the output from the computer, uh, computer would be printed on paper again. Teletypes were continued to be used as tunnels to computers until video displays became widely available in the late 1970s. Video terminals quickly became extremely popular IO devices on many different types of computers. Once manufacturers uh, moved to a set of common standards, which were ASCII, a serial port to link the terminal to a modem, in 24 rows and 80 columns of text. Today, we live in a time where physical teletypes and video terminals are obsolete. We instead have terminal emulators, which are a software simulation of the real thing. But have modern terminal emulators borrowed any legacy from these old metal beasts? Let's find out. The one thing that is clearly visible is the name. If we take out T and TY from teletype, it becomes TTY which is a prefix in the names for virtual terminals on Unix-based operating systems. The fundamental type of application that runs on a virtual terminal is a shell. The shell prompts for commands from the user and sends it to execution after they press enter, which is similar to the teletype workflow. So based on intuition, the whole thing kinda looks like this. Keyboard passes input to the terminal, which passes it to the process. The process does some work and gives the output back to the terminal, which then prints it on the display. But an illusion sits in between the terminal and the process. Term IOs. It's kind of like an interface, uh, interface through some default settings for socket communication parameters and line discipline, which affect how text is entered and printed. The man page for term IOs lists all these available settings. There's also the STTY utility, which can be used to turn these settings on or off. And STTY hyphen A shows all the settings with their current values. For example, the speed of serial communication and the number of rows and columns. Let's see what some of these settings do. I'll show the same examples Brandon Rhodes shared in his 2017 North Bay Python keynote. The first setting we look at is called iCanon. It refers to the canonical text editor used for some rudimentary editing of commands before they are sent to the process upon pressing enter. For example, moving the cursor back and forth or removing characters using backspace. Most interactive applications like text editors turn the setting off and handle all the line editing themselves. The canonical text editor is on by default and we can turn it off using STTY like this. Let's see what that does, but first we'll open cat. Since the canonical text editor is on, the input is buffered till we press enter. We can also use backspace to remove characters. Now, now let's turn off iCanon using STTY hyphen iCanon and use cat again. As you can see, the text is not being buffered now. Cat is receiving a character as soon as we enter it and printing it right away rather than one line at a time. We can turn iCanon back on by removing the hyphen from the earlier command. Another setting is ONLCR, where NL stands for new line and CR for carriage return. This setting finds new lines in text and adds a carriage return to each one of them. A carriage return makes sure that the cursor moves back to the first column after a new line. Similar to the teletype days when the paper carriage would return to the first column with a new line. A carriage return without the new line character is used to make progress bars on modern data models. The program updates the progress, moves the cursor back to the first column, and then overrides the earlier progress with the new one. ONLCR is also on by default and can be turned off using STTY like this. 
we look at PS. The output looks very structured. Now let's turn off ONLC here and look at the PS output again. We type in PS and as we can see the illusion is gone. This is a real thing. The cursor does not return to the first column even though the lines are being printed on new line. A lot of applications are written with this assumption that the terminal will automatically move back the cursor to the, new, uh, to the first column when they print a new line. There's also echo which is on by default. Echo directs the terminal to print every character that we input back on the display. What happens if we turn it off? We look at cat again. We can see what we are typing. Hello, world. But when we turn it off using sttyy hyphen echo, this happens. We didn't see cat being typed and we didn't even see the input strings until cat, which was running in the background, printed them for us. Programs turn off echo when they ask the users for passwords. If you are experimenting with Termio settings, you can use a reset command to return all of these settings to their default values. You can also check out the Termio's module in the Python standard library to turn these settings on or off from your Python code. Another way to change a terminal state is through in-band and out-of-band signals. In-band signaling means that you throw in some special characters in your input. The terminal interprets these special characters as commands and does not print them. It instead causes the intended effect. One way to do in-band signaling is using control characters. For example, control H will do a backspace and control C will interrupt the running process. And another way is to use escape sequences, which can control things like cursor location and text color. For example, printing the first sequence here will clear the screen and printing the second sequence before a string will make that string bold. Terminals are also pre-configured with input and output streams where the input stream is mapped to the keyboard and the output stream to the display. This ability to automatically map input and output to the keyboard and display by default was a Unix breakthrough. In operating systems before Unix, programs are to explicitly connect to appropriate I.O. devices which was a tedious thing to do because of a lack of standards across systems. Here, stdin is the input stream where the program reads its input data and stdout and stdr are output streams where the program writes its output data in error messages. Unless, of course, data is being redirected using some operators. The greater than and double greater than are redirection operators which redirect a, program, a program's output to a file. The only difference between the two is that the first one will override the file while the second one will append to the file. Another redirection operator is the pipe, which makes the output of one program the input to another. Now that we have an understanding of how the terminal evolved and how it works, let's look at programs that run inside a terminal. Command line interfaces. The words interfaces, applications, programs and tools are used interchangeably, but they refer to the same thing. Well, at least most of the time. CLIs make it easy to automate repetitive tasks via shell scripting and are kind of fun to use. The general usage pattern of a CLI looks like this. The shell displays the prompt as a sign that it's ready to take an input. The user then types in the command that they want to run, along with some options and some arguments, and finally ending the input by pressing the enter key. This completes the command line of text going in. The command is then executed and the output is printed on the terminal. But what are these arguments and options? Arguments are required items of information for a program, required in the sense that the program won't work without them. They are often positional, which means that an argument's position in the command line helps the program identify the argument's type. For example, here's the copy command, which can't function without both the source and destination arguments. And the argument in the first position will always be the source, and the argument in the second position will always be the destination. An option or a flag is used to modify the operation of a command. As the name suggests, they are optional and they may have some default values. The general convention is to have hyphens in front of a character or a word to identify the option. For example, in the copy command, hyphen R can change its operation by asking it to recursively look for files in the source and then copy them to the destination. And one of the criticisms of a CLI is, to, is the lack of cues it offers to the users about all its available actions in contrast to a graphical user interface, which usually informs the user about these actions uh, with menus, icons, or other visual cues. To overcome this limitation, many CLI programs display some brief documentation around the arguments and options that they support. This documentation can be viewed by invoking the CLI with the help option. Some of them also have man pages, which is short for manual page. By default, the man command uses a terminal pager program such as more or less to display the large manual for a CLI.
This makes it easy for the user to scroll and search through it. Well, you must be wondering that there's a lot of moving parts here. Each programmer could write their CLI differently. For example, they could use hyphen X instead of hyphen H to display the help text. Are there any standards to make sure that, that every CLI follows some basic conventions? Uh, yes, it's called POSIX. POSIX makes APIs provided by Unix based operating systems uniform. APIs such as command line interfaces. To follow the POSIX standard is to be POSIX compliant. There's also the XDG based directory spec, which dictates how CLI should store the different types of files that they need for their function so that everyone doesn't save files all over the place. These files could be configuration files, data files, or the program cache, which should go into these directories on a user's file system. Now let's see how we can implement a uh, command line interface using Python. There are several options to do this, both in the standard library and on PyPI. We'll use a small example CLI called smallpip and see how we can implement it using all these different options. Smallpip just has one subcommand called install, using which we can install a package from PyPI. It also has an upgrade option which uh, will upgrade the package if it's already installed in the package name required argument to identify the package itself. Let's look at the standard library first. It has a sys module which comes with the argv variable. sys.argv is a list where the first element contains the name of the CLI that was invoked. In the rest of them are command line options passed to the CLI. Internally sys.argv uses a getout module to parse and create this list of command line options. The getout module is a parser for command and options whose API is designed to be similar to the Unix getout function and it follows a POSIX standard. Let's look at some code. So when the CLI is invoked, we get the list of arguments using sys.argv and since the first element is the name of the CLI itself, we check what the element at index 1 is. If it is hyphen h or hyphen hyphen help, we print the help and do the same for the version. Finally, we check the subcommand that was invoked and dispatch control to the relevant code. Up until Python 3.2, the standard library also had the opParse module, uh, which has since been deprecated. OpParse could only parse options and not positional arguments. Something that Steven Bethard, the author of ArcParse, talks about in pep 389. This web proposed the deprecation of OpParse in the favor of the new and improved ArcParse module. It was approved by Guido on February 21, 2010, 10 years ago. ArcParse was written because both getopt and opparse support only options and not arguments. ArcParse handles both, and as a result, it is able to auto-generate better help messages. ArcParse also allowed customization of characters that are used to identify options. For example, using a plus instead of a minus, or even forward slashes. ArcParse also added support for subcommands. This is a common pattern in CLIs, for example, pip install, pip freeze, and pip search. Let's see how, we, how the small pip code looks like using uh, ArcParse. So we import ArcParse and initialize a parser object and pass in a description of our CLI. We also add a version option to it. We then initialize a sub parsers object and add a sub parser for the install command, to which we then add an upgrade option and a package name argument. The action is equal to store true, make sure that the upgrade option is treated like a boolean flag. And when the CLI is invoked, we call the parser.parseArgs function, which gives us a namespace object with all the parsed command line options as its attributes. Finally, we check the subcommand that was invoked and dispatch control to the relevant code. The nice thing is, is that we got an auto-generated help for our CLI. Now, let's look at some packages that are available on PyPI. The first one is docopt. It was written by Vladimir Kelishev and is kinda cool in the way it works. Docop takes in a documentation first approach to writing CLIs. It just requires a POSIX compliant help string as an input from which it'll infer subcommands, options, and arguments on its own. So this time around, we first create a help string which shows our CLI's description and usage. And when the CLI is invoked, we call docopt, pass in the help string and a version, and it returns a dictionary of parts command and options, which is pretty neat. We again check the subcommand that was invoked and dispatch control to the relevant code. In all examples till now, we saw that in addition to parsing results, we had to write some boilerplate to dispatch control to the relevant install and upgrade code. If we had to validate the parse command line options, we would need to add some more boilerplate. This boilerplate can grow real big for large applications. There might also be some common features that we might want to add, for example, progress bars and colors. Let's look at a package that can help us do that. Click. 
It was written by Armin Onahar to support the Flask project. Click is designed to be nestable and composable, which means that it supports arbitrary nesting of commands. For example, Python setup.py sdis bdis wheel, where the bdis wheel subcommand is called after sdist, kinda like a subcommand chain. Click also automatically dispatches control to the relevant code based on the subcommand that was invoked. It supports callbacks, which can be used to validate the parsed command line options, and it's POSIX compliant. Let's see what small pip code looks like using click. We import click, add a function called CLI with a doc string. And since click follows a decorator based approach to writing CLIs, we add a click.group decorator to the function. This makes the CLI function a command group to which subcommands can be added. We also add a version option to it. We then define a function called install with a doc string again. And this function will basically contain the code required to install or upgrade a package. We then convert this function into a subcommand using the cli.command decorator. The cli and cli.command is the command group that we defined earlier. We then add an option called upgrade along with the help string using the click.option decorator. The is flag is equal to true makes upgrade a boolean flag. Finally, we add a package name argument using the click.argument decorator. And when the CLI is invoked, click will automatically dispatch control to the relevant code, which in this case is the install function. We will get the command line arguments and options as keyword arguments to the install function, which we can then use to install or upgrade a package. Click also auto generates a help for a CLI based on the function doc strings and the option help strings that we added earlier. Click promises that when multiple apps written using Click are strung together, they will work seamlessly, which means that multiple people can work on small parts of a large CLI and then stitch them all together at the end. The Click way of building a CLI where we don't have to uh, define parsers from the start or focus on our help text from the start is great for quick iterations. Now let's look at some common use cases and see how we can implement uh, them using Click. We'll use another small example CLI called small git. Small git, as the name suggests, is a small git clone with six git subcommands clone, config, log, status, commit, and push. We again start by defining a CLI function with the click.group decorator. Now let's go through the use cases. The common CLI use case is to display progress bars to the user. For example, we should let the user know about the progress about of how many files have been cloned when they invoke the clone subcommand. Click as a progress bar utility that can help us do this. We define the clone subcommand with the source and destination arguments. Let's say, we have, let's say we have a list of files we want to clone. We pass the list to the click.progress bar context manager, which returns an iterator. As we iterate on it and download each file, click will show the user a progress bar, which will kind of look like this. So when we invoke the clone subcommand with the repo name, we get to see a progress bar as the files are being downloaded one by one. Another use case is to persist user specific configuration to a file. For example, we should persist things like username and email in our application folder when the user sets them using the config subcommand. Click provides a function which can help us do this. We define a config subcommand with the key and value arguments. Then we get an application folder path for small git using the get app dir function. We create a, create a path if it does not exist and finally store user specific config settings in a file called config. This makes sure that our CLI follows the XDG spec. And since the getAppDish function is cross-platform, it will run the most appropriate path on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. And it looks like this. I set the username to Vinayak. And if I do a cat on the config file in the application folder for small git, I can see that it is set. And we can re reuse this in the future. We should also page large CLI outputs. So, the, so that the user can scroll through it instead of printing it all at once. We can do this for the large commit log that the log subcommand prints. Click supports paged output by calling a terminal pager program. So we define a log subcommand where we can use the click.echo via pager function to display the log string. And it looks like this. When I invoke the log subcommand, I can scroll through the large commit log. Here it's using the less terminal pager program. We should also add color to file names that are added or modified when they are printed using the status subcommand. Click supports adding color to text using the colorama package. And colorama adds ANSI escape sequences to text to color it. And to do this, we define a status subcommand. Let's say we have a list of files and their status. We can use the click.style function to add a foreground color and make the string bold. 
Finally, we output it using click.echo. The nice thing here is that click will auto escape these escape sequences. And like when the output is redirected to a file. And uh, because like when we do that, it, it's usually a log file and we would, would not want to look at incomprehensible escape sequences while figuring out what went wrong in the log. And this is what it looks like. Uh, when we invoke the status subcommand, we can see the new file that has been added, a.txt, and it is colored green. Sometimes we might also want multi-line input from the user. For example, asking the user for a commit message when they invoke the commit subcommand. Click supports launching editors for this use case, and it automatically opens the user's defined editor or falls back to a sensible default. We define a commit subcommand with the message option, and if the user doesn't use a message option when they uh, invoke the uh, commit subcommand, we launch an editor to get that commit message. And it looks like this. In this case, it opened Vim, which is my default editor. I pass in the commit message and it gets committed to the log. We can also ask users for one line input using the click.prompt function. This can be useful for the push subcommand to ask a user for credentials to push files to a remote repo. We define a push subcommand with two arguments, the remote repo we want to push to and the local branch we want to push. And then we use the click.prompt function to ask the user for the username and password. The return values will be stored in the username and password variables here. Also notice that for the password prompt, we've set hide input is equal to true. This won't print the password that the user types on the terminal. Internally, click uses get pass from the standard app to do this. And get pass turns the echo setting off using the term IOS module. And this is what it looks like. I pass in my username, Vinayak, and then I type in the password and it's not visible. And finally, the files get pushed to the remote repo. And we are done. We have a small get CLI with the help auto-generated. Click also let us, uh, lets us test the CLIs that we write. We can use the CLI runner class to invoke each subcommand in a CLI and check the result against their expected output. And these are only a subset of the features that Click has to offer. You should totally check out the Click docs at this link uh, to look at more awesome things that you can do with Click. Finally, let's pack it small git. To do this, we just create a setup.py outside the small git module and add a console scripts entry point to it. Console scripts allows uh, Python functions to be registered as command line programs. You can ch check out other things in the setup.py um, uh, in the GitHub link at the uh, end of this presentation. And once we package a CLI, we can also push it to PyPI so that other people can install and use it. To do this, we create a source distribution and a wheel using setup.py and then upload them to PyPI using Twine. Now that we know how to write CLIs in Python, let's briefly talk about the CLI user experience. As mentioned earlier, we are operating in a very constrained design space as compared to graphical user interfaces, which offer a lot more visual cues and guidance to the user. There are some principles that can help us create a nice UX for the CLIs that we write. The first is to keep things simple and follow the Unix philosophy of doing one thing and doing it really well. Writing programs so that they can work together using the redirection operators and handling text streams. Following the Unix philosophy, make sure that there are no surprises when the users interact with the CLX. And the second is by making features discoverable by being forthcoming about them. Kind of similar to the cues that the graphical interfaces offer. Some things that can let us do, do, do that are storing a user's command line history and letting them search through it and maybe giving them suggestions for auto-completion based on this history and the features that our CLI supports. Amjit Ramanujam talks about this in detail in his PyCon 2017 talk, which you can find in the resources. He also talks about Prompt Toolkit, a Python package by Jonathan Slenders. Prompt Toolkit can help you implement some of the history and auto-completion features we just talked about and make your CLI fancy. It's used by IPython and all the DB CLI tools. Finally, we are at the end of our CLI journey. I hope you got a lot of touch points through the CLI ecosystem, which you can now explore further. And I hope you also got an understanding of how terminals and CLIs work and how to write CLIs using Python. This slide contains links to some of the resources that I mentioned throughout the talk. The slides are themselves available on the first link. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter at vortex underscore ape or using the contact information on my website. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and be well.